Also, please refrain from eating, drinking, or smoking anything during the performance. For your convenience, toilets are located in the lobby. Also, please take a moment now to locate the exits nearest to your seat. Should the theater experience a sudden loss of pressure, oxygen masks will drop automatically. Simply place the mask over your nose and mouth and continue to breathe normally. If you are at the theater with a small child, please place your own mask on first and look a little above your head for a step. <coughs> At this time, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Danielle Singer of the Reduced Shakespeare Company. And tonight, we are going to attempt a feat which we believe to be unprecedented in the history of theater. That is, to capture in a single theatrical experience the magic, the genius, the towering grandeur that is the complete works of William Shakespeare. Now, we have a lot to get through tonight. So this time, I'd like to introduce a member of the company who is one of California's preeminent Shakespearean scholars. She has a master's degree from the University of California at Berkeley, where I believe she read two books about William Shakespeare. She is here tonight to provide a brief preface to the complete works of William Shakespeare abridged. Please welcome me and join me to the stage, Ms. Jen Borgeson. Thank you, Danielle. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. William Shakespeare, playwright, Poet, actor, philosopher, a man whose creative and literary genius have had an immeasurably profound influence upon the consciousness and culture of the entire English speaking world. And yet, how much do we inhabitants of the 20th century? 21st century. It's 20, 21, 20, 0. Whatever it is. Well, the 21st century truly know and appreciate the tremendous body of knowledge contained in this single volume. Too little, I would argue. I believe I can illustrate this point by conducting a brief poll here among our audience. If I may have the house lights for just a moment, please. Now, you are a theater-going crowd, no doubt of above average cultural and literary awareness. And yet, if I may just have a brief show of hands, how many of you here tonight have ever seen or read any play by William Shakespeare? Any contact at all with the bar your hands? I think they might know more than we do. Maybe we better get out of here. Don't worry about it. No, we should really start winning now. Better know Shakespeare from Shinola. Just keep going. What should I do? Narrow it down. What? Narrow it down. <clears throat> Let's see if we can narrow it down a bit, shall we? How many of you have ever seen or read, let's say, Oswald the Dental? Yes, that seems to be separating the wheat from the chaff rather nicely. Let's see if we can find out who the true Shakespeare trivia champs are tonight. Has anybody ever seen or read King John? King John, anyone? You have. Really? Would you mind telling us what it's about? It's about a hunchback. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, right, you laugh, ladies and gentlemen, you scoff. But such he or she among you who is free from sin live in a glass house. For that face, ladies and gentlemen, that face represents all your faces. That empty brain represents your empty brain. Those glazed eyes are your glazed eyes. These teeth are your teeth, and they cry out, Bless me! Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that our society's collective capacity to comprehend, much less attain, the genius of a lynch. <coughs> Shakespeare has been systematically compromised by computers, vandalized by video games, saturated with soap operas, and dumped its death blow by Dan Coyle. But have no fear. The reduced Shakespeare company is here. We descend among you on a mission from God and the literary muse to spread the holy word of the bard to the masses. Tell me you take those first halting sets out to the 20th century. 21st. The 21st century quagmire of Corden, Jimmy Fallon, and Oprah Jesse Raphael a future where this book will be found in every hotel room in the world. This is my dream, ladies and gentlemen, and it begins here tonight. Join us in taking those first steps down the path towards the brave new world of intellectual redemption by opening your hearts. Yes, please open your hearts and your pocketbooks, or simply charge your donations to your MasterCard or Visa by phoning 1-800-THE-BARD right now. Give us your cash if we be friends and deduct it when the tax year ends. On the show, and may the board be with you. Thank you. And oh, no. those of you who own a copy of this book know that no collection is complete without a brief biography of the life of William Shakespeare. Here to provide this portion of the show will be the third. 
third member of the Reduce Shakespeare Company. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Adam Long. I've just been taking a few notes on Shakespeare's life, so we can get the show off to a good start. So you can know all the stuff he did and everything. Just get on with it. Okay, okay. William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was born in 1564 in the town of Stratford-upon-Avon, Warwickshire. The third of eight children, he was the eldest son of John Shakespeare, a lovely prominent merchant, and Mary Arden, daughter of a Roman Catholic member of the land of Gentry. In 1582, he married a farmer's daughter named Anne Hathaway. Different Anne Hathaway. That's a shame. Shakespeare arrived in London in 1588. There he dictated to his secretary, Rudolf Hess, the work of Mein Kampf. The war between the states divided the United States along the Mason-Dixon line, and the Union and Confederate armies fought long and hard. Shakespeare invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, thus precipitating World War II. Huh. I never knew that before. Shakespeare remained in Berlin when the Russians entered the city and committed suicide with his mistress, Ava Perron. He lies buried in the church of Stratford, though his head is frozen in a holding tank in Glendale, California. Thank you. Go along with 
But new struck nine. I be sad hours seem long. What sadness lengthens Romeo's hours? Not having that which having makes them short. In love? Out. Out of love? Out of her favor where I am in love. Alas, that love, so gentle in his view, should be so rough and tyrannous in proof. Alas, that love, whose view is muffled still, should without eyes see pathways to his will. Oh. oh. Come ye to the feast of Capulet. There sups the fair Rosalind, whom thou so lovest, with all the admired beauties of Verona. Go thither, and compare her face to some that I shall show. And I shall make thee think thy swan a crow. I'll go along, no such sight to be shown, but to rejoice in splendor of my own. And so much for scenes one and two. So, now to the feast of Capulet, where Romeo is doomed to meet his Juliet, and where in a scene of timeless romance, he'll try to get into Juliet's pants. <laughs> Then good night indeed. If that thy bed of love be honorable, and 
by purpose in our to send word to Good night. Good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow. <laughs> really, it is. <laughs> Sleep dwell upon thy eyes. Peace in thy breast. Oh, if I were sleep in peace, so sweet to rest. Oh. Lo, Romeo did swoon with love. By Cupid, he'd been crippled. But Juliet had a loathsome cause, whose loathsome name was Tybalt. Romeo, the love I bear thee can afford no better term than this. Thou art a villain, therefore turn and draw. Tybalt, I do protest. I never injured thee, but loved thee more than thou canst devise. Thou wretched boy, I fool you. <laughs> Take thou this vial, and this distilled liquor drink thou 
life. And presently through all thy veins shall run a cold and drowsy hero.
That was a lot. So, now I'm presenting you Shakespeare's first tragedy, Othello. You know, Titus Andronicus as a cooking show.
Here's the story of a brother by the name of a fella. He liked white women and he liked green jello. Yeah, yeah, uh, and a pope in the yellow made some of this. He did it like a fellow, the more of Dennis. Now a fellow got married to Jester and Mona. Took up for the wars and he left her alone. It was a Mona, a grown up. He left her alone. He didn't write a letter and he didn't tell what he doesn't put it to a picture of Jester and Dyke. She's the daughter of the Duke. She was totally white, but Iago had a plan that was playing the earth like he would crack. He was like, he was sort of a dick. He said, I'm going to shout the more. How you gonna do it? Tell us! Well, I know the plot is that he's too damn jealous! jealous. I need a dope, I need a dope, I need a kind of smoke. So you find a drunk soaker by the name of Jesse O. And play it on in, just know his handkerchief. And the fellow gets to wondering just maybe if, will he been out fighting? Command an army? Or does he cast play hot salami? S -s -s salami? Salami! Came back home to take a pillow in her face. Killed her until the cause is about his disgrace. There's Amelia at the door. Who we met in Act 4. We say you were big dope, she went for a horse. Shores of Italy, 
disguise themselves as men and become paid to the shrews and matchmakers to the duke's brother's sons. They lead all the lovers into a nearby forest where on a midsummer's night, a bunch of mischievous fairies <coughs> use the aphrodisiac juice of a hermaphroditic flower in the shrew's eyes, causing them to fall in love with their own pages, who in turn have fallen in love with the duke's brother's sons. While the queen of the fairies seduces a jackass, and they all have a lovely bisexual animalistic orgy. <laughs> messages of pages telling them to kill any men in the vicinity. However, unable to find men in the forest, the faithful messengers, in a final misguided act of loyalty, deliver the messages to each other and kill themselves. Meanwhile, the fish creature and the duke arrive in the forest, disguised as Russians, and for no apparent reason, perform a two-man underwater version of Uncle Vanya. Act 5. The duke commands the fairies to right their wrongs. The pages and the bedfellows get into a knockdown, drag out fight in the mud. During which the pages' clothes get ripped off, revealing female genitalia. The duke recognizes his daughters. The, the duke's brother's sons recognize their uncle. One of the bedfellows grows up to be Vanna White. And they all get married and go out to dinner. Except for a minor character in the second act, who gets eaten by a bear. And the duke's brother's son, too. Unable to pay back the old merchant, give themselves lobotomies. <laughs> and they, they all, all live happily ever after. <laughs> we now move on to the rest of Shakespeare's tragedies, because basically we found that the comedies aren't half as funny as the tragedies. <laughs> Take, for example, Shakespeare's Scottish play, <laughs> Caesar. 
Hey, no citizens. Who was warned by a soothsayer? Beware of the Ides of March. The great Caesar, however, chose to ignore this warning. What the hell are the Ides of March? The 15th of March. Why, that's today. <laughs> to Boutet. <clears throat> Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I've come to bury Caesar, so bury him. And let's get on to my play. Antony and, and Cleopatra, it is an ass by sea before me. Come, venomous wretch. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? No, stop. What? You have this bizarre notion that all of Shakespeare's tragic counties were really ugly wigs and vomited on people before they died. It's an interpretation. Vomiting is not an interpretation. Well, they were into it. Adam, Antony and Cleopatra have nothing to do with gastrointestinal distress. It's an exciting trans global thrill about political maneuver across the ancient Mediterranean. Oh, it's one of Shakespeare's trans global plays? Well, I love those. Like that one that totally predicted 21st century's wireless communication? What? Yeah, was it called the Two Mobile Kinsmen? Adam, Shakespeare wrote a play called Two Noble Kinsmen. Not Two Mobile Kinsmen. Two, two Noble Kinsmen. kinsmen. No, it was definitely mobile because two kinsmen are Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. No. The two kinsmen are two cousins who fall in love with the same woman. Oh, they're like text your OMG, you're my BFF, LOL. No! Well, F you, I didn't even hear of that play. Well, that's because the two noble kinsmen fall into the categories of Shakespeare's plays, which are neither tragedy, comedy, nor history, in which scholars refer to as the problem plays, or in some circles, the obscure plays or the lesser plays, or simply, the bad plays. And yet, not all of the apocrypha have gone completely without merit. In fact, one of them, Trollus and Cressida, is hardly crap at all. I actually discussed it at some length in my sweet to release book about William Shakespeare entitled I Love My Willie, in which I like a collaborating now. <laughs> Oh, I love performance art. It's so pretentious. We could use the Troyes and Cressida as a jumping off point to explore deeper themes like the transient nature of life and the mythology involved in the arising and dissipation of forms. Yeah, go get some props. Now, hold on a minute. I was actually thinking of more straightforward scholarly approach. Nah, screw that. <laughs> well, okay. <clears throat> Troyes and Cressida was written in 1603, published in Porto in 1604, and appears in the first Folio, although this version is some 166 lines longer than the second Prado edition of 1645, in which appears the fa famous Chihuahua scene. What are you doing? Generation to the next, 
It is exactly like playing football, but you do it with the crown. Hey, they are kind of similar, aren't they? Yeah, I can see that. All right, line them up. Let's get macho. 25, 42, which is third, heading to fifth. Part one, two, three, four. Oh, and the crown is snapped over to the second. That well is fucking 14 century. Why not just fading back to pass in the front here going to but oh, there's a heavy rush from King John. Oh, my gross blessings downwards. And the crown is in the air, and heavy to six comes up with it. Victory is mine. Sorry, got kind of 
McGillan's story. Now we don't need that McGillan plate. Where do you think you're going? I'll kill little Timmy. I'll kill him. I don't think you're going to turn him off to the her off to life theater. Get back here. This is it. You think of your head. You bet. Thank you. Helmet, the tra Hamlet, the tragedy of the Prince of Denmark. The place, Denmark. Midnight, the battlements of Elsinore Castle. Two guards enter. Who's there? Nah, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. 
Donato. He? Tis now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Felatio. Horatio. To this piece, much thanks. Break the oath. Look where it comes! <laughs> Mark, yet it would be spoke to. By heaven, I try to be speak!
Hagar against the sea of trouble and by opposing Enda to die, to sleep, to chance to nap, to doze, to snooze, for chance too much, it's too hard. Mom, let's sleep. Sorry, sorry. What's the matter? What happens here? Speak. They were laughing at me. They were laughing at you. They were laughing adjacent to you. No, no, no.
displaying a sublimated childhood neurosis, displacing repressed edible desires towards sexualized Ophelia towards, wait, sexualized anger towards Ophelia. Hey, that's being a prick. Exactly. Now the id, which is you, represents the raw animal power of the individual, which Adam has effectively encapsulated in Ophelia's trademark screen. I think you jazz. You're welcome. <laughs> this is clearly going over her head. Just give them a chance. <laughs> so, yeah. Adam gets all worked up and tells Ophelia to get out of his life and says, get thee to an enemy. And in response, Ophelia's in screams. It's very simple. Hamlet says, get thee to an honor, and Ophelia's in screams. Got it? Hey, thanks for breaking up the group, Yoko. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll give you your cue. Hold on, let me just step into character. Get thee to an honor.
There's actually a great line about makeup straight from the Shakespearean text. Why don't we have them say, paint an inch thick? Awesome. Let's try it. Section B? Wow, section A. You could learn something from section B over here, all right? Seriously. Now, section C. You're the most important player of them all. We're going to use you to make Ophelia relevant to the 21st century. Interesting. So maybe Ophelia wants power, but doesn't want to lose her femininity. Maybe she wants to be a corporate executive, but also wants to raise a family. Yes! She's tired of being pushed around, and she just feels like saying, Look, cut the crap, Hamlet. My biological clock is ticking, and I want babies now! <laughs> Why don't we just have them say that? Okay, section C. You'll say, Cut the crap, Hamlet. My biological clock is ticking, and I want babies now!
to hear the process. Confess. The Queen correct 
do not drink. As well, my lord, I pray you pardon me. It is the poisoned cup. It is too late. <laughs> Come for a third there, Keith. Oh, whatever. <laughs> How does the queen? She swoons to see thee bleed. No! The drink! The drink! I have poisoned! Stop! Oh, villainy, treachery, seek it out! Here it is, Hamlet. Here I lie, never to rise again. The king. The king, Sibylle. What? The poison venom, too? O oh, venom to thy work. Here, thou incestuous murderous cross-dressing day, follow my mother!
So both your friends. And if you 